unflinching gaze into the depths of human depravity. The podcast covers current crime news, updates on cold cases and resources for research and investigation. True Crime Review often discusses disturbing and violent crimes, so listener discretion is advised. And this is True Crime Review for Friday, September 9th, 2016. Today we're gonna do uh, we're gonna do four stories. I know it's been a few more days than I said it would be uh, at the end of the last episode. Uh, still feeling this out. I'm probably gonna end up on once a week, uh, and you know, and try to get a, a better sense of how many stories we're gonna cover in each episode. Uh, but for now, we're just gonna dive uh, straight into the uh, to the news. Uh, so probably the biggest news um, this week has been the recent break in the cold case of uh, the disappearance of Jacob Wetterling. And Jacob disappeared in 1989 in St. Joseph, Minnesota, where he lived. Um, and despite uh, extensive searches and investigations and uh, even national media attention, he... Uh, the case had never been solved. And only a week or two ago, uh, an individual came forward to police um, and told them that he had kidnapped and raped and murdered uh, Jacob. And there was an extensive uh, confession given uh, by the individual, Danny Heinrich, uh, in court. And uh, apparently authorities have used the information uh, given to them by Heinrich to, in fact, locate uh, and exhume Jacob's remains. Um, so obviously a heart-wrenching uh, end, but an end nonetheless to a nearly 30-year nightmare for his parents and uh, and for St. Joseph, Minnesota, and um, for a lot of people who whose innocence was sort of shattered in, in some way. Uh, you know, this is sort of uh, one of the classic cases of, you know, before Jacob disappeared, kids roamed around on their bikes and had... Um, you know, and had fun outside, you know, relatively uh, unattended, relatively safe. And after Jacob's disappearance, a lot of that, not just in St. Joseph, Minnesota, but all over the country, a lot of that changed. Um, And so we're not sure what's going to happen yet as far as the the suspect, but I am going to keep an eye on it. And I just want to read to you this. I'm going to read this statement uh, in full. It's from the Jacob Wetterling Resource Center, which I believe is an organization uh, started by his parents to uh, essentially assist uh, the families of victims in similar circumstances. And they say, quote, we are in deep grief. We didn't want Jacob's story to end this way. In this moment of pain and shock, we go back to the beginning. The Wetterlings had a choice to walk into bitterness and anger or to walk into a light of what could be, a light of hope. Their choice changed the world. This light has been burning for close to 27 years. The spark began in the moment after the abduction of Jacob Wetterling when his family decided that light is stronger than darkness. They lit the flame that became Jacob's hope. All of central Minnesota flocked to and fanned the flame, hoping for answers. The light spread statewide, nationally and globally, as hearts connected to the 11-year-old boy who liked to play goalie for his hockey team, wanted to be a football player, played the trombone, and loved the times he spent with his sisters 
brother, and parents. Today we gather around the same flame, the flame that has become more than the hope for one as it led the way home for thousands of others. It's the light that illuminates a world that Jacob believed in, where things are fair and just. Our hearts are heavy, but we are being held up by all of the people who have been a part of making Jacob's hope a light that will never be extinguished. It shines on in a different way. We are, and we will continue to be, Jacob's hope. Jacob, you are loved. So again, a very tragic end, but um, but an end nonetheless uh, for his family and everybody who um, for so long was hoping uh, that he would uh, be returned safely. Our second story is um, another tragedy. Uh, um, the wife of a crazy person um, was afraid that he was going to kill her if he got out of jail. And that's exactly what happened. Tierney, I don't know if I'm saying that right, but Tierney Ewing's father, Richard Kopko, told the television station in Pittsburgh, quote, she was scared to death of him. He threatened her all the time. The victim's father said this in wake of the Washington County woman's death after she was kidnapped twice this summer by her husband and beaten several times. And the fact that these crimes, these previous crimes had occurred and, um, and she was constantly in fear of being um, uh, brutalized by this man, again, was a well-founded fear, a tragically well-founded fear. Uh, she was shot to death by her husband while he was out of jail on bail and subject to electronic monitoring following an alleged kidnapping earlier that, that summer uh, of the victim in this murder. Uh, Pennsylvania State Police, after intensive search for the couple, found her body Tuesday evening in a barn in West Finley Township, only miles away from where she was kidnapped earlier the same day. She had been killed by a gunshot. Her husband, 47-year-old Kevin Ewing, the piece of human garbage that did this to her, was captured with an apparent self-inflicted gunshot wound and pronounced brain dead at the hospital later the next afternoon. An autopsy on him is pending, but who cares what happened to him? What matters is what he did to Tierney. I really hope I'm pronouncing that right. I feel really bad when I mispronounce names. Tierney Ewing. Um, Washington County Judge uh, Gary Gilman is probably searching his conscience a little bit. Uh, this weekend, following his denial of the county district attorney's office request to deny Mr. Ewing bail and the judge's decision to uh, release Mr. Ewing on electronic ankle bracelet under a $100,000 bond. Apparently, uh, according to the state police, Ewing cut off the ankle device and left it at home before kidnapping his wife for the final time at gunpoint. Assistant District Attorney Kristen Klingerman told a local TV station that Tierney kept saying, I know he's going to kill me. I know he's going to kill me. The victim's father added, they put a bracelet on him and she's six miles away. Oh, give me a break. Something's wrong with the judging system in this country. That gentleman is right. Um, that gentleman is exactly right. 
I don't have all of the answers, um, but it's very clear. I have some experience uh, dealing with the criminal justice system in Pennsylvania from, um, from the perspective of uh, the judge's office and working with district attorneys and defense attorneys um, to uh, schedule and uh, implement trials and and other um and other criminal justice matters and domestic violence is an extremely difficult type of case to work with because similar to uh, sexual assault or child molestation uh, once the accusation is made uh, and acted upon by the state um it's very rarely it goes away and so I think that there is a misguided um, reluctance among many judges to uh, to stick that that phrase, uh, you know, abuser, uh, uh, domestic violence, uh, criminal, uh, on people without a thousand percent proof. And that's just not that's just not the kind of policy that's going to keep women like Tierney Ewing safe. Um, so very, very tragic story there. And, um, and, you know, hopefully we will see, we will see some kind of change come from, uh, awful cases like this, where this woman, um, you know, not only lived in fear, but died in fear and, and, and died in the very, very absolutely 100% exact same way that she was afraid she was going to die. Just terrible. Our third story is also tragic, although it's a little more mysterious. Rita Mays made a phone call from a rest stop near Wolf Creek, Montana, earlier this week. She called her two phone calls, actually. She called her husband and daughter on the way to Spokane, Washington, saying a large man in a black hoodie had hit her on the head and put her in the trunk of her black Pontiac Grand Prix. And uh, authorities found her by uh, tracking the cell towers that her phone was pinging um, and found her in the trunk of her car in an industrial area near Geiger Boulevard and Spotted Road. She was in the trunk with a single gunshot wound to the torso. A handgun and two spent casings lay next to her. And this was widely reported in local and national media um, earlier this week as, you know, just what we said. You know, a woman trapped in her own trunk made a couple of phone calls to immediate family telling them, uh, you know, that she had been uh, carjacked and kidnapped in her trunk um, and that she needed help. What changed later in the week, yesterday and today, Thursday and Friday, is the following. Asked if news outlets should question Mays's kidnapping narrative, Spokane County Sheriff Olive Nezovich replied Thursday, Yes, you should. The medical examiner's office concluded Mays died of the single gunshot wound, but said further investigation was needed to determine whether the death was a homicide. Essentially, the authorities are saying that there is some suspicion on their part, or at least... Um, an inability to rule out at this time the possibility that that she killed herself you know, for some reason, uh, some unknown reason, and I guess wanted to make it look like a murder to perhaps spare her family the thought of uh, her killing herself. Is there anything we could do? Was it our fault? And, and all of those things that I think probably rush through the minds uh, uh, of the families of a lot of suicide victims.
Someone used her credit cards at two convenience stores in the hours before her death. And um, her daughter is apparently not questioning the manner of death. She is um, feels very sure that it is it was a homicide. Um, her daughter said that she believes uh, her mother was abducted. She did not hit herself, stuff herself in the trunk, and drive all the way to Spokane and shoot herself. Um, deputies reported no one else was in the car when they found it. The keys were in the ignition, and the purse was in the front seat. There was blood on the ground, and a $20 bill lay nearby. Um, just, so the fact that the car is, is abandoned with the body uh, of this woman, uh, Rita Mays, and nothing is taken. There's a purse, there's cash. Um, nothing is taken. You know, it, it, do, it does leave some questions, because if I'm carjacking this woman... I want her car, okay, but the car is abandoned. Um, maybe I'm a sexual predator. There's no indication, at least in what's been reported, that she was sexually assaulted. Um, maybe I just want money. The purse and cash are left behind. So there seems to be not only no, none of the usual motives for a person close to a victim to commit murder or kidnap, um, but really none of the sort of non-motives that you would attribute to um, a compulsive uh, violent offender, like a serial killer or a serial um, a sexual predator or something like that. So I, I don't think that it's, that it's crazy that authorities you know, are trying to, to decide whether the evidence points more towards homicide or suicide. Um, the sheriff told uh, reporters that people should hesitate to call the death a homicide, quote, until we actually find out what is going on. So uh, that's sort of a mystery up in the air. Um, and I'll, I'll definitely keep an eye on that because, um, you know, whatever happened, homicide or suicide, it's, it's again, there's always the, the primary victim and sort of secondary victims of a crime. And, you know, whether this woman was the victim of somebody else committing homicide or the victim of herself committing suicide, uh, the secondary victims are her husband, um, you know, are her, her uh, daughter. I'm sorry, I don't know if she is currently married, but her father was, um, was quoted in the story. Oh, no, I'm sorry, she is, she is married. Um, anyway, her whole family has been victimized by this, so hopefully they'll get answers. We're going to do one more story today. I know you're, um, maybe you're watching the clock here. This is almost twice as long as our first two episodes. And, um, and that's just because I'm starting to get the hang of our format and what we're looking at. And you heard the introduction. Maybe it scared you. Uh, yeah. To some extent, it's supposed to scare a little bit. So, um, you know, it catches your attention. I hope you like it. Um, last story is an awful, terrible story it takes us to China where, um, I forget if it was episode one or two, but we did talk about one of China's most notorious serial killers, uh, recently being apprehended, uh, married father of two. Um, we are going back to China for this story, um, uh, where apparently there is a tradition, I don't know if tradition is the word, but in especially it still exists in, in a lot of more isolated rural communities. There's a tradition of ghost weddings. Um, in February, two men posed as matchmakers and promised a mentally disabled woman they would find her a husband. They lured the woman away from her home and stabbed her with a needle full of a powerful sedative, killing her. The men then hired another man to drive the body to a different county in a different province where it was sold for 35,000 yen for use in a local ghost wedding. They tried the very same thing again 
This past April, however, this time their vehicle was pulled over by police and a dead woman's body was found inside. Last week, the men were charged. They were charged with abduction, human trafficking, and murder. The men there in these uh, rural provinces, I can't speak Chinese. I'm going to try just to be a good sport. Um, the provinces of Shanxi and Shanxi. I don't know. I'm sorry. Um, but in these provinces, there are too few women and the work that men do is too dangerous. This leads to numerous men dying unmarried. However, families believe it is bad luck for a man to go into the afterlife unmarried. It could even put a curse on the whole family. So sometimes families arrange ghost weddings between recently departed bachelors and a buried woman. A fresh female corpse can fetch upward of 100,000 yen on the black market. In May, one family shelled out 180,000 yen. And I don't know how much that is, but I'll put it in the show notes um, for one such quote-unquote ghost wedding. One unfortunate village... Um, among the, the two that I mentioned a minute ago, is haunted by grave robbers and has lost 15 female corpses in the past three years um, for this um, awful practice. With demand so high, though, it some criminals are, uh, according to Shanghaiist.com, finding it easier simply to murder than to dig up. Um, while corpse brides and ghost weddings are illegal, it still seems that the business is going strong. Last October, police in one of these provinces detained three people suspected of stealing a corpse for such a wedding. And back in 2013, a gang of four was caught selling ten corpses for 240,000 yen altogether. Um, so, you know, that's awful. Right. Um, that is, you know, sort of macabre and would seem to me to be extremely disrespectful of the dead. I have a very limited understanding of Chinese culture. Um, it doesn't sound like this is a mainstream practice. It doesn't sound like most uh, Chinese would uh, look kindly upon this kind of a thing. Um, but the fact that it still exists, you know, is uh, sort of a signal of uh, the consequences of certain practices China, in particular China's leadership, has engaged in in the past, particularly the one-child um, policy, you know, where a lot of women are um, either aborted or abandoned uh, or adopted in the past. And there is this, uh, you know, majority of men and uh, too few women for them to find uh, you know, an eligible bachelorette. And apparently, as the story also said, a lot of the work in these smaller villages is extremely dangerous. Stuff like coal mining. Um, so the combination of very few women and just a short life expectancy um, is apparently leading to a lot of men dying single. And that, coupled with a rural, um, more traditional, and more isolated uh, village setting, seems to be the perfect recipe for um, these murders and, and grave robbings uh, for so-called ghost weddings. Uh, that's about it. We're going to finish this one up, about 25 minutes. Um, all told, you can find... Uh, the podcast on iTunes. Finally, you can find it on Google Play, uh, True Crime Review. Um, our primary publishing platform is SoundCloud. If you like SoundCloud, you can go to soundcloud.com slash True Crime Review. You can find us 
at whatever network, social network you want to find us at, <laughs> dot com slash true crime review. Uh, except for Twitter. Twitter, we are true crime rev. True crime R-E-V. Because uh, somebody else, uh, and if somebody else didn't have it, it's just, it's too long, true crime review, to use as a Twitter username. So uh, we also have email, finally. So um, you can send an email to podcast at truecrimereview.net. And you can, uh, uh, that's probably the best way to submit things like criticisms, comments, uh, story requests, anything like that. Um, If you do want to leave a review, I hope that it's going to be positive. And um, and the best place to do that is iTunes, because that's uh, sort of the, the easiest way to get us some more listeners. Um, finally, for Redditors, uh, we are on Reddit at reddit.com slash r slash true crime review. And uh, the stories we cover on the podcast, as well as many, many others, um, will appear on that subreddit. And it would be great if we had more users over there who would vote up the stories that they, um, they want to hear. Uh, every week, this uh, looks like it will become a, a weekly thing. I'll probably uh, start going on Wednesdays instead of Friday like today. Um, but once again, thanks a lot for listening. This has been episode three of True Crime Review.